Hello everyone, I'm here with a very special guest. His name is Jordan Sheridan. He's an author, columnist, journalist, and now documentary filmmaker who is here to talk about his new documentary called Flushing Flint. Jordan, thank you for joining the program. Thanks for having me from my uh, Airbnb uh, right outside Flint. <laughs> hey, that's great. You're where you exactly need to be and um, where I think more journalists should be. Um, if we learned anything from your documentary, because what you expose in this documentary really is a gigantic scandal that, I mean, really the hopes with journalism is that it exposes these scandals so government takes action. So we'll get to that and what the outcome was of your documentary. But first, I do want to share a trailer from the film so that way people know um, what we're talking about here. When the water changed color to brown and orange, your administration said the water was safe. When people reported rashes, hair loss, odor, and even sewage, your administration said the water was safe. When Legionnaire's disease began to infect and later kill numerous citizens, your administration said the water was safe. I'm a journalist. I'm just asking residents on this block if the state ever came to test your water. They told me they needed to go to the kitchen sink. That's where they went. They turned the water on, let it run for, like I said, like a minute, and collected their sample. Your results are interesting because 15 parts per billion is the limit. Um, so them telling you to let the water run for that long, that's probably why you were getting such low results. Mm. When they did it, do you remember if they turned the water on and took the sample right away or did they let it run they first? They let it run a while. They showed up at my door and they handed me a pamphlet and said, okay, it's safe to bathe in before they even went in my house. Have you had any problems health-wise since the water switch? Itching, breaking down, stuff like that. My teeth. Yeah, so. And I've had pneumonia. I skin and I hear. I've been getting a lot of boils. Go ahead, get it. Right. Bro, I'm telling you. And I get them like, just, just, bro. Yeah. And they were worse. My daughter did have a miscarriage. He was at Heritage Manor, went to McLaren, where they had the Legionnaires. My father is dead. They want us out of here. They want to make it a college town, and we are not a fool. We know it. Go up and down the street. Look, look over there. We have a forest in the daggum city. We can't drink our water. We can't go outside and play. We ain't got no parks. They're just going in, people who don't know EPA regulations, people that are older, people that are younger, people that are poor, whatever. And they're just right in front of them, cheating, to try and get a lower number. So who the hell knows what the real numbers are? You always hear that talking point, well, like 3,000 other cities have worse numbers than Flint. I think what we're getting at here is we probably don't know the real lead levels in Flint because they've been flushing out the lead before they test. So can you just give us the rundown overall? What is this about in terms of do we start at the very beginning or do we start at a very specific focus with regard to the Flint water crisis? Yeah, so I want your audience to imagine George W. Bush coming down in that F-16, whatever it was, with the commando suit and declaring mission accomplished. Mm -hmm. um, think of that in terms of Flint. This is Flint's mission accomplished. Of course, it's different. You know, there's not like hundreds of thousands of people dead. But Bush and his cronies, really Cheney, you know, cooked up intelligence and false stuff to send us to war. Uh, in Flint, what we found, and this was through knocking on 450 doors last summer. Um, so this is not a story of what happened to cause the lead crisis. This is what happened to cover it up. So we found that the numbers that the state of Michigan were sending out, declaring that 
Flint was once again within EPA regulations for lead were basically cooked up. Uh, how we found that was originally uh, a little over a year ago, I was in Flint uh, doing another story and I started talking to re residents for that story. And sometimes you're doing one story and another one just like you unearth it. So I found out that some, some residents had state officials come to their homes and test their water, and they ran their water first before taking the samples. This might sound like nothing, but it's actually illegal. Uh, if you run the water even for 30 seconds before taking lead and copper samples, you essentially could be flushing out the, the, the thick of the lead because a lot of the lead is actually inside the home. So we found that they did this in a few homes. So my partner, Jen, and I, who broke the story with me, decided to just stay in Flint. We were kind of just like, you know, crowdfunding at the time, early days of status quo. Um, and we started knocking on doors. And ultimately, every door we knocked, not every door, but the more doors we knocked, you keep getting the same horrific tale that, yeah, they just cooked the testing. Like they intentionally we're sending state officials into these residents' homes. These residents were on the official state testing program. So this state testing program was the focus group, and this is the data they used to declare, like, Flint's mission accomplished. The water is now meeting EPA regulations. So it was a mix of state officials going in and running the water before taking the sample and state officials telling residents when you test, run the water. So the the... the the, the big boilerplate message from this is, A, they cook the data and testing. B, if they cook the data and testing, how do we know what the real lead levels are today? This week is the five-year anniversary. So we broke that story in November. That's the documentary showcases Jen and I uh, basically doing like what very few do these days, unfortunately, which is trading our summer at the beach for like door knocking. I mean, you'll, you saw me schwitzing uh, in 100 degree weather. And uh, fortunately, the story is not over because we met with some pretty high ranking government officials uh, two months ago in Michigan. It's now a Democrat governor, a Democrat AG. And um, I can't go into like so much detail, but they're, they're looking basically at what we found and we'll see what happens from there. That's great. And that's exactly what you want from these types of reports and documentary, you know, filmmaking. One thing that really struck me was as you go through and you talk to dozens of people in the film, you kind of make it very clear that they had this false sense of security where somebody came in, tested their water, they were under the assumption that it was clean because as you said, they were running the water beforehand, which isn't an accurate way to test it. And then you kind of see on their faces the looks of just horror when they realize, wow, I've been drinking this water, I've been using this water, and it isn't actually safe. And part of the story that was really gut-wrenching for me is when you were talking to people and you were detailing, or really they were detailing, how much medical issues they were having. And one anecdote that really stood out for me was when you spoke to a woman who had recently moved to Flint. She had her daughter there. She was showing all the rashes that the water caused. She had sickle cell anemia and she was in and out of the hospital. And to me, that one really stood out because it, it shows not just how damaging the water is on their bodies, but how quickly it happened. Like she was there for a couple of months and all of these medical issues kind of bubbled up to the surface that maybe they were already predisposed to have certain issues, but to see how quickly the water made them worse, it was horrible. So can you talk a little bit about the medical issues that people were having? Because obviously I'm just kind of pulling out one example, but there was another lady who was experiencing, um, it wasn't epilepsy, she said, I believe, but she was experiencing seizures and they were treating her as if she had epilepsy. And this was all presumably because of the water. So can you talk about some of these medical issues that people have been telling you they've experienced because of the water? Yeah, and I want to make clear the most striking thing that I want people to know, hopefully when they watch the documentary, that mother you told me that you were referencing with the daughter sitting on her lap that mm -hmm. had the white white blisters all over her arms and legs in her ears that was a, right they had just moved into that home in may 2018 she had clear skin it was within two weeks really that they had, she had white blisters this was one month after governor snyder now former governor declared the water restored so mm -hmm. what what we're trying to show in this documentary is you know, a one-year-old baby after a few weeks in a home is not getting white rashes and blisters from watching television. The yeah. mother bathed her for 30, uh, for thir almost 30 minutes, 
because they told her her water was fine. So I think what the documentary will show is we're not talking about the carnage and the disaster that happened five years ago. It's still people are still actively having these rashers. You see people losing hair, uh, people getting nosebleeds, uh, autoimmune issues, this and that. But I think what other pe- what people will see for the documentary is because of the false sense of security. One woman, Amanda Jane, she was 35. Uh, she was the one I was talking to on the porch who was in chemo. Mm. She, she never had a health problem in her life, like a cold once in a blue moon, but that's it. She was drinking the water, uh, and then you know it became a national headline, so she stopped for a little bit. A, a Department of Environmental Quality official comes to her home, runs her water for anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute, uh, she doesn't know anything. She doesn't know any better. They were just, like you said, happy that people came to test the water. She gets a slip in the mail, no, no lead. So she goes back to drinking it without a filter because some fixtures filters don't fit over uh, because it's an old faucet or whatever. So she had no filter on, and even people who drink with a filter have still had problems. But uh, because she got that slip of paper from the state environmental agency saying, you know, no lead detection. Well, they probably got that because they ran her water. So I'm not a doctor. I can't say definitively this, you know, X caused Y, but never had a health problem. uh, In 2016, she gets spots on her kidneys. A few weeks later, she's having heart palpitations, severe fatigue. They find spots in her thyroid. Then it's diagnosed as thyroid cancer. So again, she has no family history for thyroid cancer. Her doctor said, potentially, it could have started in your kidney, which lead affects your kidney and moved to your thyroid. So you have resident after resident, including children, who, because the water was declared safe and they shut down the water pods based on this declaration, they can't afford to go buy bottled bottled water cases and cases because most of them are poor. There's also a lot of people without transportation in Flint. So they're drinking from the tap because it's declared fine. Well, if the testing, if the if that declaration is based on the manipulated test that we found, well, they could potentially be drinking contaminated water still, and that's what I think people need to see. I think the other part of the documentary that's more human interest, like you said, I mean, you have people with learning disabilities now, children. You have people really with learning, uh, you know, delays. Children who forgot the alphabet, forgot used to be able to count to thirty, now stop at twelve. Uh, the one-year-old that you were describing used to say mama now says vava. Um, no, uh, it wasn't shown in the documentary, but I know people still having nosebleeds. I know people, uh, and Jen and I, we were stunned, Mike. We would go, I mean, we really canvassed. We hit 450 doors. Every, almost every block we went, we would find, you know, you knock on one door, they're not home. Somebody else answers. You ask, Oh, you know, do you know if that person's coming home tonight? What time they usually get home? Because maybe we'd come back. They say, oh, they just died. We're not talking like senior citizens. You're talking people 40s, 50s, 60s. So this is, it's unfortunately been a silent, continual crisis that's been silent because our corporate media is a bunch of propagandists who, you know, have basically created a new Cold War. And really, even before that, they they stopped covering this because once Trump came down that escalator, it was, you know, that was it. But you have this happening. And I want to be clear. I mean, this kind of stuff is happening in other cities, too. They're gaming the water testing in other cities. And it's really at at a certain point, it's kind of like I don't want to be too strong, but it, it is in a way kind of murderous. I mean, you're intentionally testing the wrong way giving people false numbers. I mean, it's, it's actually a crime to falsify a federal uh, regulatory compliance test. You're giving people false numbers, and then they're drinking the water and potentially getting lead. They had bacterial issues with the water in Flint that wasn't, you know, they only focused on lead, uh, most of the headlines. But there was bacteria, there were TTHMs, which are cancer-causing chemicals, God knows what else. So it, it's really horrifying, and I think what else is horrifying beyond just Flint is... This was done really just brazenly. I mean, Mm -hmm. the the state environmental officials were going into these homes testing the wrong way, and they did it because they probably didn't expect anyone to actually follow their steps and knock on doors and talk to people. So that's why I always tell my viewers, like, listen, corruption, it's not easy to find, but it's also not like so hard to find because most corrupt agencies, individuals are sloppy. Who's going to investigate them? Brian Williams? You know, like Anderson Cooper. So they don't expect anyone to look. 
But I think if you watch this documentary, I hope that people see. I mean, the, the best the best example is my younger brother. He's not really into politics. I mean, he's a good guy, but he's just not in our space. So he doesn't really watch. Uh, he watched yesterday. He texted me. I cannot believe this is happening in America. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, and I think that the way you guys go about with this documentary and just like you really can get a sense of how many people you talk to and just sharing their stories. I think that's so important because we kind of have the tendency as human beings to tune out if something doesn't affect us. But what you really prime people to believe, I think, in this documentary is that this can happen to you. It's not just about Flint, but this can happen and it's happening in America. So to really get these anecdotes, to hear these personal stories, I think that that really was the strength of the documentary. And there's so many things that you made me think about in this documentary that I hadn't initially really thought deeply about. Um, a lot of the people you spoke with raised the specter that they think this is an ethnic cleansing. You have Flint, which is a majority minority community. People think that they're being ethnically cleansed. Um, you're kind of giving, I think, a lot of researchers a gift in saying, look, there's a lot of correlations here with the water and medical issues. We can't say de definitively as journalists that this is because of, you know, causation and correlation aren't necessarily the same thing. But we can say that there's enough there there to where somebody needs to get out there and test this immediately. You also touched on corporate media, and I don't know how much you want to get into here, but um, this is based off of Towards the end of the documentary, you said very definitively, fuck the New York Times. Um, and I really felt that anger that you were communicating to us because, um, again, I don't want to spoil the documentary because I, I want people to watch it. But basically, you discover this bombshell story and corporate media doesn't care about what you specifically ha have to say. They essentially try to steal the story from you. Do you want to go into that or do you want to because I don't want to because I feel like that's such a huge piece in the documentary and it kind of you get a happy ending towards the happy ending towards the end but in the journalistic sense that you're getting the word out but do you want to talk about that at all because i found that just completely fascinating and infuriating at the same time yeah and i also just want to say uh ty bayless who's our photojournalist he's been my cameraman for a few years he was a one-man crew usually documentaries have like four or five people working on it he's done production directing editing audio he hasn't wow. slept in three three days to finish this so <laughs> Props to Shout him. Shout out to Ty. Uh, so there's two two things with the media. Number one, you know, I think the last bit of naivete I had uh, about his car corporate media was kind of just like sucked out of me with this because yeah. I really thought like, oh my, I, I get it. Like we're in a 24-7 Trump Russia thing, but this is too big. Like some outlet will pick this up because, uh, uh, you know, when we found this, we had just launched Status Coup. So like we're not at that time, we're not like a big enough outlet that we're just going to publish this on our own and it's going to go viral. Like I was willing to publish it at, at a more corporate outlet that has broader reach. So I think between Jen and I, we probably reached out to at least 100 or so outlets. We got a mix of we don't have the bandwidth for this. <laughs> uh, we got a mix of is there a connection to Trump? I mean, frankly, wow. this started under Obama and there is really no, I mean, Trump hasn't made it better, obviously, but there's mm -hmm. no like core Trump angle. We got um well you know we don't really use freelancers i said can you make an exception for like ethnic and environmental cover-up that aaron brockovich calls one of the biggest cover-ups of the 21st century mm -hmm. i even i even offered outlets well uh, throw your name on there first we don't need like first bill because we just want the story out so um full disclosure i don't think it was in the documentary but it was supposed to be published with newsweek mm. in november um, they kind of dragged their feet. It was supposed to be published in September, but because of Kavanaugh and, and that whole uh, month long of coverage, which I understood, I mean, it was a big story and we were okay having it pushed. But in November, it was supposed to be published in Newsweek magazine, which would have been pretty big. And we get an email the day before, uh, and I quote, uh, as in politics, when you're explaining, you're losing. Wow. Me meaning it was too complicated to explain which I guess Newsweek thinks their audience is pretty dumb because it's not complicated. They flushed, they flushed the lead out before they took the samples. You explained so it they, in 30 seconds in the documentary. <laughs> right, right. They also said we didn't have enough data. And I said, we knocked on 450 doors and spoke with 150 residents and have paperwork to, pr to, to support a lot of this. Mm -hmm. So we decided to self-publish it. But um, basically, while we were 
while we were in the field, um, you know, I was, I was, I, I had talked to the Daily Beast. They were originally interested and then backed away for whatever reason. So I reached out to the New York Times. I didn't give them the whole story, but I, I said, this is what we're finding. Um, and, you know, I'd love to publish it with you guys. So I was pretty surprised. They got back to me pretty quickly. I got bounced from one editor in New York to the Chicago bureau chief. So the Chicago bureau chief responds to me basically with that kind of entitlement, arrogant New York Times response. Well, we have we have plenty of reporters in the Midwest that we check in from time to time on Flint, whatever that means. So, you know, if we were going to publish this, we would do it ourselves. So I wrote back, I'm happy to co-publish it. I don't need first bill. The New York Times could make it seem like I don't really care. We just want this out. Then uh, as we're knocking on doors, I get a call from one of my main sources here saying, oh, a New York Times reporter just called her about water testing in Flint. And if she knew anything about, um, you know, fault manipulated testing uh, and the source said, yeah, I do. Uh, but you're going to have to talk to Jordan because, you know, they've been knocking on doors and it's their story. So <laughs> basically, the New York Times took it's not like a viewer where you just like send a hot tip. Like mm -hmm. I deliberately pitched it to publish with them. And instead of, you know, the, the crime of going with a freelance journalist, they basically tried to like take it, uh, basically take my reporting and, and report it themselves, I guess. And then when she told them that, instead of contacting me again, they contacted a scientist who has nothing to do with the story but has gotten a lot of national media headlines as like the hero of Flint. Mm. But he really, he didn't know anything about the story. He didn't know what we found anything to basically ask him, do you know anything about, you know, f manipulated testing? And he was like, he basically waved them off of it because he didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. So it's just an example of, the, it was a perfect storm of media outlets who are 24 seven submerged in Trump and Russia and Stormy Daniels and whatever else. And, you know, don't get me wrong. I read the Mueller report, most of it. I think there are very bad things in there. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's, as I thought, there's there's nothing sinister as far as collusion. But there is a president that obviously, if he was not president, would be charged with obstruction of justice. Yeah. But call me old fashioned, Mike. I think we could walk and chew gum at the same times. And if you watch this documentary, I would like to ask you, what is the gravest threat to our democracy? Fake Facebook pages from Russia or <laughs> People that are poisoned, that the numbers are then cooked and, and told your water's fine. That's my opinion is it's the latter. Uh, it's really a shame because, you know, you have outlets. I don't think they're that progressive, but like Mother Jones, for example, passed. The Intercept passed. Uh, I mean, Democracy Now! I've been trying to get on Democracy Now! about this. For some reason, I can't get a response. You have, I mean, Young Turks didn't take it. Um, there's all, the nation, you know, not even like getting responses from, from some outlets, which makes you wonder because like, I like a lot of those outlets for the most part, but it makes you wonder independent media and progressive media exists to basically do what we know the corporate media is not going to do. So, uh, I think a lot of independent media, not just because of this, but in a lot of other cases has kind of gotten lost in the Trump thing too. And I think we all need to realize, yes, Trump needs to be covered. He is uh, doing some very damaging things, but there's a reason Trump became president in the first place, and that's because the New York and D.C. kind of coastal media are pretty much totally clueless as to what's going on out in the country. And I think too many times we as uh, corporate media and some independent media, you know, you cover something like Flint for the two weeks that the media was there, and then it's that's it. Same thing with mass shootings, same things with you know, black men getting massacred. And it's a story for now. Mass shootings are a story for maybe a day yeah. before. So, um, you know, I think media is, I think you'll see in this documentary, it's not a major uh, part of it, but uh, it will show you how not, you would think that if in a normal media environment, you break a story like this, it, it would get some traction, right? Mm -hmm. But we, we, Newsweek killed it. And, and frankly, I mean, if I'm keeping it real, I, I happen to like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez a lot. But even some progressives have not said anything about this. Um, her, Rashida Tlaib, you know, benefit of the doubt, maybe their their advisors didn't bring it to them. I don't know. Yeah. But I, I've talked because, you know, one of the ways to get attention is to get your progressives with a, with a big following to say something. And then, I mean, national media covers if she breathes, <laughs> much That's less. That's true. 
<laughs> so um, I'm hoping that uh, with the documentary coming out um, and hopefully more uh, coming out mm -hmm. uh, once it's looked at by authorities, uh, that we get more people on this. Because like you said, the, the reason I cover Flint so much is not just because of Flint. If you take the cameras away from Flint, if, if the let, when the cameras leave, when the microphones leave, and frankly, I mean this humbly, we have been the only camera here for a long time. Yeah. We're always stunned when we come here. This is my 14th time. There's really few national media here. Um, when that happens and, and it just is normalized, poisoning people and then cooking the numbers to falsely declare the water's fine, that's the playbook for everywhere else. Other Rick Snyders are going to be like, well, they got away with it there, so... Yeah. No, and I think that what you're speaking to with people like AOC not talking about this, I don't know how much of that is a political decision. Like, she doesn't want to talk about it because it's not politically expedient. I, I would like to think it's not. I mean, this should be right up her alley. But another thing is, I think that a lot of this also is people being desensitized. Like you said, with mass shootings, we talk about it for a couple of days and then it's over. You know, it's it, the, the news cycle replaces itself with something else so that's why i think that the documentary is really important because it kind of gets all of us to not feel as desensitized because it reminds you in a very concrete way this is the impact these are the faces of the people that it's affecting and it's still happening and one thing that kind of hangs over the documentary is the fact that they still don't have clean drinking water. Like, that's that's kind of on the top of your mind. Like, you're not watching this and thinking, wow, I can't believe this happened. Like, it's still happening. So I wanted to ask you, this kind of goes beyond, you know, the documentary and the duration of time where you filmed. We have a turnover in government. Gretchen Whitmore is now the governor. Rick Snyder is out. In terms of accountability, in terms of people going to jail, in terms of actually getting this fixed, what are we looking at? Is there any hope or is it still people dragging their feet, bureaucracy kind of um, slowing things down? What is your sense in that regard? You know, obviously it, it's not moving as quickly as I think it should. Um, like I said, and like I think you're pointing out, this is still a crisis. I mean, it's not like it's gotten better. I mean, Maybe the maybe the numbers are fine if they test the right way. Maybe they'll find the numbers are fine. But I could tell you, People don't usually get rashes five years later and 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 hair loss. And th if the water's just dandy and I've anecdotally, I've tasted the water in a few places. It tastes like dog piss. So I, I could tell you, Governor Gretchen Whitmer optically is way better than uh, Governor Snyder. She has come to Flint, including last week. She did a panel with residents about regaining trust. She actually, during that panel, confirmed our reporting. She, somebody mm -hmm. asked her about the water testing. She said, oh, you know, there's been reports about running the water. Um, she has not publicly said anything as far as there needs to be an investigation about this. She has not publicly said anything about there needs, it needs to be looked in as far as the ex-governor. I think this is a bit of Barack Obama syndrome where he said, we don't want to look backwards as far as Bush and his officials. We want to look mm. forward. Um, I, there could be a lot of reasons for that, I, political reasons. Uh, so in the nitty gritty, optically, she's better. She's she's visited Flint. She's talking to Flint residents. But nitty gritty, I mean, there's still a lot of pipes that need to be replaced. And not to get too in the weeds, what a lot of people don't realize, and the media, because they're all lazy and not that bright, it's not just the service lines. So your audience knows the service lines are the water pipes from the curb into the house. They're only changing those. They're not touching residents' interior plumbing. And a lot of the problem, it's not like, OK, Jesus could bless the water if you believe in Jesus. He could bless the water anew. It goes through brand new pipes that are not lead. But if it's going into busted interior pipes, there's still chance for lead and other heavy metals to come off those pipes. So they're not touching the interior plumbing because by law, the interior plumbing is the homeowner's responsibility. Well, the homeowners did not change from Detroit's water to the Flint River. The homeowners didn't forget to add the proper corrosion control chemicals. So they're not touching the interior plumbing. And I think that's a major thing they could. And this the only reason they're changing the service lines is because of a lawsuit from uh, ACLU and residents and this and that that got a lot of money towards service line replacement. So I think one thing I want to I don't know if it came across in the documentary, but if this happened anywhere in Manhattan, if this happened anywhere in D.C., probably even Portland. Um, 
would have been fixed pretty quick. Yeah. Um, even in Michigan, they found high levels of PFAS, which are cancer causing chemicals that they're finding actually a lot more all over the country. They're, they're chemicals made from the manufacturing of things like Teflon. Governor Snyder, that it, it was happening in, in cities in Michigan that are a lot more white, more middle class. There was free water going in there right away and action right away. So I don't really bother with environmental racism. This is just racism. Yeah. Uh, you know, Flint is predominantly black. There's, but it's also, uh, as Bernie always talks about and gets criticized for, it's also a class issue because there's a hell of a lot of poor white people in Flint, too. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the last thing is what I hope the documentary shows, because we tried to show the history of how things got so impoverished in Flint and how things got so bad. Things like a water crisis don't happen in a vacuum. It, it, the reason it happens is because there is a controlled demolition of what once was the middle class. Flint, for people that know, you know economic history, Flint was called Vehicle City. Flint was at one time had some of the best schools in the country, had the middle class, had auto workers from General Motors. They used to have over 100,000 auto workers in Flint from General Motors uh, and other cities. But when you start, um, you know, trade, selling off jobs to China and Mexico, racist rezoning laws, white flight, um, when, you know, for in the in the in the spirit of economic development, the private all these privatization schemes, the Flint water crisis, the media never covered this way. It was really a privatization scheme. Yeah. They were they were temporarily temporarily switching to the Flint River while they were building a privatized water pipeline. And when they switched to the Flint River, the environmental de the Department of Environmental Quality actually broke the law. By law, you're supposed to add corrosion control chemicals into the water for the exact reason. So old pipes because our government has not changed the pipes in over 60 years all over America, don't, corro don't leach lead. So I want people to understand this happened. It happened because Governor Snyder appointed an unelected emergency manager that was essentially a proxy for him. The emergency manager decided we're going we're gonna to switch from the Detroit water system, which never had a problem for Flint. Flint purchased its water from Detroit system to the Flint River, which... I don't know about Portland, but think of like the Hudson River in, mm -hmm. in, in New York. I mean, this is like, you know, General Motors had dumped its parts in there for over a century. Jeez. You know, you had in some cases dead bodies rolling around. So I hope people watch the documentary. And I also people I hope people realize that independent media is critically important. So we were able to do it and knock on the doors because our viewers funded us. We're growing, but like fund independent media, whether it's us whether it's Mike, whether who, whether it's whomever, you know, some people, uh, you know, expose things from a studio setup. Some people s expose things from, uh, you know, knocking on doors, whatever it is. We're all trying to expose what the corporate media and frankly, the politicians are covering up. Yeah. So I hope people uh, realize that uh, if they watch the documentary, which I hope they do, um, this is this is happening in more places than Flint. And the only re the only way that you light an inferno under politicians behinds to make them do something is to wake more people up, because I guarantee you there's Republicans who will see this documentary that will be pissed. Oh, well, there are because well, it could affect them. You know, you see the faces and you think that could very well be me. And as you said, like the water pipes, they're what, 60 plus years old in the country. So, of yeah. course, it can affect you. So that's why I think that these types of documentaries are so important when you just sit there and it's beat into your head for more than an hour, I think the, the documentary is an hour, 49 minutes or so. You sit there and you listen to all these stories and you think, holy shit, like it, you, to really humanize this issue, I think that's so crucial. So I hope people do check out the documentary. By the time um, this interview goes up, it will have passed the launch date. It comes out April 23rd. Tell us how we can go about watching this. Can you rent it? Can you purchase it? And also tell us where we can become a member to support more of your reporting because I know you're not going to stop. Yeah. So, you know, in classic status quo fashion, we've been advertising April 23rd, but we are now in an Airbnb that has horrible Wi-Fi. So <laughs> it might be up April 23rd, but based on export and upload, more likely April 24th, April 23rd or 24th, April 23rd ish. Yes. Um, which it is what it is. It's 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 like a eight gigabyte file for those of you that are tech people. Um, it will be up on flushingflint.com. You can go there now. It has the trailer. 
uh, and a lot the original story. Uh, you could actually access it right now if you're a Status Quo member. We made it available for our members and patrons. So you can become a Status Quo member at statusquo.com slash join. I hope actual like old school journalism is worth it. You know, we have different plans, five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month. And we made that available Sundays. So you could it's up on our website under member content. And uh, yeah, I really hope people won't stop at watching the documentary, because if you think this can not happen to you, trust me, it can. And in many cases, it's already happening to people and they don't know it. Uh, water utilities are gaming the system, and it's not just the EPA, it's not just the state, um, the state environmental agencies. We're talking about the CDC. We're talking about the Department of Health and Human Services. You would think like, oh, it's our government. They want to get to the bottom. It's in their benefit to actually find the lowest numbers possible, whether it's lead or other things, so they don't have to pay for the problem. And this is bipartisan because this has happened under both um, administrations. And the simplest way of putting it, Water is life, which we heard a lot during Standing Rock, is not a bumper sticker. It's true. Yeah. So if you don't have if you don't have clean water, uh, if you don't have water, period, for X amount of days, you're going to get sick and die. Uh, and if you have un if you have contaminated water for so long, it's going to forever change your life. If you're a child getting exposed to this, there's adults. Even though adults aren't talked about as much, I know people that are 38, 30, 39 that I have become close friends with sources of mine, I don't mean it in a bad way towards them. They, they look 65, 70 mm -hmm. from, from lead and, and other contaminants that were in their body. I know people that, uh, you know, are, are basically go from zero to 60 as far as temper because lead causes emotional volatility, mood swings, um, learning disabilities, things like that. I mean, if you come to Flint, it's really it's really uh, you. Will, it, you will quickly see that this was never. This crisis was always a crisis, but it wasn't treated that way by the media and the politicians. So I really hope people will watch. Again, you can watch it right now. Statuscoup.com slash join. And I really appreciate it. You know, we need people in independent media. I went on the Hill, uh, covered it. So kudos That's to great. them. Um, and we're trying to get more traction. So I hope people, especially the fact that this Thursday is five years. That's Five years since, since an American city had clean drinking water. We all need to get off Twitter for a second and put down our phones and let that sink in. Like a first world country, supposedly the beacon of the world, has led a city for five years, basically fend for themselves. And the reason is they're, they're poor and they're majority minority. And yeah. that's pretty, pretty shameful. Yeah. And you get all a sense of that in the documentary. So it's flushingflint.com, statusku.com. Jordan Sheridan, thank you so much for coming and uh, just talking about this. I think that the documentary is fantastic. And I really hope that people uh, feel encouraged to watch it because we really like you have to get a sense of what's happening, like just listening to it in this abstract way, you know, uh, hearing the news stories every now and then it's not the same as seeing the faces. So I really hope that people do feel inclined to check it out. Thanks, Jordan.